Hi guys, this is Dr. Pavan, your Surajee Educator on an Academy platform and today I'm here to talk to you about the next thing which we are starting. So we are here to introduce you to the weekly test in the general surgery. So what I will be doing is every Saturday I will be uploading a short surgery quiz, let's say of four or five questions and then we will have a detailed discussion about these particular questions. So without wasting any further time, let us start with this particular test. So the first question which we have in this particular test is that which of the following is true regarding the sentinel lymph node biopsy? So the option with one says that the failure to identify the sentinel lymph node by either the blue dye or a radioactive colloid occurs in less than 5%. So what do you think? Is it a true or a false statement? So yeah, the first option is a failure to identify the sentinel lymph node with either the blue dye or a radioactive colloid occurs in less than 5%. So we know that we have the two methods for the kind of a sentinel lymph node biopsy. First is the kind of a radioactive uh, colloid and the other one is a blue dye. So if this particular option is saying that if you use any of these, the chances of not finding the sentinel lymph node, it is less than 5%. Is it true or false? I don't know. Let me know. Option number B is the procedure has a high false negative rate. Do you think it's a correct statement? Okay. The option number three says that there is no role of this particular sentinel lymph node biopsy in the ductal carcinoma in situ. Okay. Option number D is utilization of the technetium radiocolloid is contraindicated in the pregnancy. Do you think it's a correct statement? Okay. Option number E says that it uh, says that if you in the patients undergoing a new adjunct chemotherapy, the procedure must be performed before initiating the chemotherapy. So option number five is trying to sell you that if at all you're planning to give a new adjuvant chemotherapy in a patient, then you should perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy before kind of doing this particular new adjuvant chemotherapy. So what do you think is the correct answer? So if you think that the correct answer to this particular question is option number A, you're absolutely correct. So let us have a look at all these particular options. Option number A is the failure to identify the sentinel lymph node by either the blue dye or a radioactive colloid is in less than 5%. This is absolutely true because the sensitivity of the sentinel lymph node biopsy, it is good as far as the breast carcinoma is concerned. I hope you get this. Now, option number B says the procedure has a high false negative rate. This is a wrong statement. So the sentinel lymph node biopsy per se, the false negative rate of this particular procedure is close to 10%. Okay. So it is not high. It is close to 10%. Now, option number C says that there is no role in the ductal carcinoma institute. Now, this is something which you need to understand. You will argue with me that the ductal carcinoma institute means that it is a carcinoma institute. Yes, agreed. If it is a carcinoma institute, you might say that this particular cells, like the carcinoma cells or whatever the cells of this particular tumor, are not going across the basement membrane and maybe they are not uh, going to the distant sites or maybe they are not going to the lymph nodes. So, why to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy in this particular patient? Now, please understand one particular thing. If at all there is a patient of a ductal carcinoma, in situ, you are absolutely correct. The cells of the ductal carcinoma in situ, they will not go to the distal lymph nodes. But okay, so how do you manage a patient with a ductal carcinoma in situ? You have to go for a simple mastectomy or maybe a wide local excision. So there is a chance that when you kind of take out the specimen, when you do a simple mastectomy or a wide local excision, in that particular specimen, you might find a foci of a invasive ductal carcinoma, which was missed when you performed a true cut biopsy and the true cut biopsy gave you a ductal carcinoma in situ. Are you understanding my point? So if such kind of a scenario occurs, then you will not be able to go back in time and do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And at this particular point, you have already operated on the patient. So you have already altered the lymphatic drainage of the breast and you will not be able to perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy. This is the reason why in the patients of a ductal carcinoma in situ, whenever you have this particular patient along with whatever you do, a simple mastectomy or a wide local excision, you have to proceed and do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. I hope you get this particular point. Now, Option number D, this basically says that the technetium radio label uh, colloid, this is basically contraindicated in the patients of a pregnancy. Now, this is in fact a wrong statement. In fact, technetium radio colloids, it is the preferred method of doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy in the pregnant patients. In fact, the blue dye technique is the one which is contraindicated in the patients who are pregnant. I hope you get this particular point. And option number E is absolutely false because neoadjuvant chemotherapy doesn't hamper the lymphatic danger of the breast and you do not need to perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy before that. You can do a sentinel lymph node biopsy whenever you plan this particular patient for the surgery after you have done with the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is about the first question.
now let us move on to the next question next question basically says that the successful antibiotic penetration of the burns scar can be achieved by so all these four are the topical agents which you apply in the patients of a burns so the question is trying to ask you which of these particular agents is able to penetrate the scar in the burns patient so options are mifenamide acid neomycin silver nitrate and the sulfur sulfadiazine so what do you think is the answer to this particular question the answer to this particular question is mifenamide acid okay so please understand the answer to this particular question is mifenamide acid now this is something which you need to remember i hope you know this but even if you did not just make a point make a note of it that mifenamide acid is a kind of a topical agent which can uh, penetrate the scar very very effectively okay now if i just ask you what are the two more important points about mifenamide acid which you need to understand and which you need to remember can you please tell me what are the two other points of the mifenamide acid which you need to remember first is it is associated with the metabolic acidosis so if at all you kind of apply this mefanimide acid to a particular patient there is a chance that the patient might land up into metabolic acidosis now why is this so because mefanimide acid per se it has an inherent carbonic anhydrase inhibitor activity and because of this the patient has a propensity to land up into um, metabolic acidosis i hope you get this particular point now another very very important point about the mefenamide acid is it has a painful application so whenever you apply mefenamide acid on the patient of a burns the applications of this particular topical agent are painful i hope you remember i hope you understand this particular point now in contradictory to the sulfur sulfadiazine which is in fact the most commonly used topical agent the application of the sulfur sulfadiazine these are kind of soothing for the patient okay so patient has a soothing effect when you apply the sulfur sulfadiazine on these particular patients i hope you get this particular point and yeah these are the important things which you need to remember in this particular question now let us move on uh, to the question number three so the question number six uh, asks you what is the best test to localize a gastrinoma so what do you understand by gastrinoma it is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor fair enough now what are the other pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors we have an insulinoma then we have a gastrinoma glucagonoma vipoma somatostatinoma and others okay so we have all these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor what this question is trying to ask you which of the following test is best to localize the gastrinoma so the options are mri ct scan abdominal usg octreotide scan or a selective angiography what do you think is the correct answer in this particular question can you please tell me so if you are thinking that the correct answer to this particular question is in fact the octreotide scan you are absolutely correct now let us kind of break down the pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors so i did tell you that the most common pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is insulinoma fair enough what are the other pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors so you have a gastrinoma somatostatinoma vipoma and others so what is the basic difference between the insulinoma and the other pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in the insulinoma you do not have a somatostatin receptor please understand it is very very important on the insulinoma you do not have a somatostatin receptor while on the other hand in the patients of all the other pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that is a gastrinoma somatostatinoma vipoma whatever it is these patients have a somatostatin receptor on those particular tumor so this is something which we can use so we know that the octreotide this is a basically somatostatin analog so what we can do is we can tag this octreotide with a kind of a radio label dye and we can send it inside the body so what will it do it will go and attach to a somatostatin receptor so wherever this particular gastrinoma is present there will be a somatostatin receptor and there the octreotide will go and attach to it and if it attaches to it we can basically localize the gastrinoma in this particular way i hope you get this particular point okay now in insulinoma we do not have a kind of a somatostatin receptor so can we use octreotide scan no not at all we cannot use octreotide scan in order to localize the insulinoma so what do you use in the insulinoma so best investigation to localize the insulinoma is intraoperative usg it is a very very important question please remember this okay so the best test to localize an insulinoma is intraoperative usg now coming back to the gastrinoma so let us talk about this octreotide scan do you think it's a, one of the best and the wonderful investigation to localize gastrinoma the answer is no please understand if at all there is a chance of a duodenal gastrinoma which in fact is the most common site of the gastrinoma okay or if at all the size of the gastrinoma is less than 1.1 cm if at all these two are the conditions the octreotide scan is not very sensitive in order to localize these particular gastrinomas so if at all this specifically ask you like what is the preferred investigation to localize a duodenal gastrinoma or maybe a gastrinoma of size less than 1.1 cm probably you should answer an endoscopic usg but it is very unlikely that you will be asked this particular question most surely you will be asked what is a investigation of choice to localize a gastrinoma please understand it is an octreotide scan so how do we proceed this if at all we 
go for octreotide scan if it is negative. If at all you suspect that the tumor may be less than 1.1 centimeters or maybe it's a duodenal gastrinoma, you proceed and do an endoscopic USG. But even after performing these two particular tests, around 30% of the gastrinomas cannot be localized. But if you have a very, very high clinical suspicion, you go ahead and do a surgery. Around 30% of the gastrinomas are basically intraoperatively detected. Okay, so these were a couple of additional points for you. But yes, you cannot afford to forget that investigation of choice to localize a gastrinoma is octreotide scan. I hope you get this particular point. Now, moving on to the option number four, right? The question number four. So what is the best test to confirm the eradication of a H. pylori after treatment? Now, this is a very, very important question. So what do you think? What is the best test to confirm the eradication of the H. pylori after the treatment? The options for you are H. pylori serology, then urease bread test, histology biopsy, then uh, rapid urease test and the anterior mucosal biopsy with culture. So what do you think is the kind of a test, best test to kind of a confirm the eradication of the H. pylori? Well, the answer to this particular question is option number B. If you th thought about option number B, you're absolutely correct. So answer is option number B, that is urease bread test. Now let us talk about each of these particular tests because students have a bit of a problem understanding these. So let us break down each of these particular test so first test is h pylori serology now this h pylori serology this particular test is positive in an acute infection so if at all there is a person who is having an acute infection which at h pylori definitely the serology will be positive but at the same time if that same particular patient has been cured of it if the kind of h pylori has been eradicated from this particular patient still the patient will continue to have a positive serology are you understanding my point so it really doesn't matter whether the patient is having an acute infection or the patient has been cured of this particular infection or something the patient is going to have a positive serology very very important so that is why we cannot use it in order to see whether the patient has been eradicated with h pylori or not are you understanding my point now option number b is urease bread test now what exactly do you do in the urease bed test you basically give the patient a radio labeled urea now this test is basically based on the fact we basically take an advantage of a fact that h pylori has a urease enzyme in it so what you do you basically send a radio labeled urea inside the kind of a you know uh, uh, to the patient so this basically goes into the stomach and there by the action of the urease we get a radio labeled co2 now once this particular radio label CO2, if at all it is formed, it will be exhaled out. So if the, we get a kind of a radio label CO2 in the exhaled air, we quantify it and then we, able, we are able to find out whether there is any H. pylori present inside the stomach or not. So please understand this is the basic principle of performing a urease breath test. And this is in fact the preferred test for looking whether the H. pylori has been eradicated or not. I hope you get this particular point. Now let us talk about the option number C and E together. Now if somebody asks you what is a gold standard investigation in order to diagnose H. pylori, your answer would be an anterior mucosal biopsy with a culture or maybe an histopathological biopsy. I hope you get this particular point. Okay, so it's different gold standard investigation to diagnose H. pylori. It is a biopsy with culture or maybe a biopsy with uh, histopathological examination. I hope you get this particular point. Okay, so it is a biopsy with a uh, kind of histopathological examination or in culture. But if at all somebody asks you what is a preferred investigation to kind of look for the eradication of H. pylori after you have already given the treatment, your answer should be urea breath test. I hope you get this particular point. Now, coming to the last option, which is a rapid urease test. Now, what is this rapid urease test? Now, this is basically also referred to as a C CLO test, which is compilobacter like organism test. Okay, so what happens in this particular test is okay. So let's imagine if there's a patient who came to you with some GI symptoms, you did a upper G endoscopy, you found there was a lesion, you took a biopsy, and the patient was positive for H. pylori. Fair enough, you started the patient of H. pylori, but when you did the previous endoscopy, you found some kind of abnormality in the stomach for which, anyways, the patient has to go for a repeat endoscopic biopsy. So, anyways, the patient has to go for a repeat endoscopic biopsy. Why not when you go for a next biopsy like uh, endoscopy why not take up a biopsy and try to look whether the H. pylori is still present there or not so this is what is called as a rapid urease test so what you exactly do is when you do your next kind of upper G endoscopy you take a small piece of that particular mucosal biopsy and then you subject it to a urease enzyme and then you are able to see whether the H. pylori is present or not but please understand this is done only when the patient is already supposed to undergo endoscopy for any other reason you do not specifically subject the patient for to an endoscopy just to see whether the H. pylori has been eradicated or not. So I hope you are able to appreciate these two particular scenarios. 
the preferred investigation to look for the eradication of H. pylori, no doubt it is a urease breath test because it is a non-invasive and if you just compare the results of the urease breath test with the rapid urease test, they are more or less the same. But if at all, the patient is already supposed to be subjected to some apogee endoscopy due to or for any other reason, why not take up a biopsy and subject the, that particular biopsy or rapid urease test and get the result. I hope you are able to appreciate this and all these are the investigations which you basically perform for an H. pylori. Okay, so I hope you know what are these investigations and now I hope you know the indications of all these kind of tests. So that is all for the surgery test for today. I hope you liked it. Uh, thank you so much for joining me guys and I'll, I'll see you again next Saturday. So please subscribe to the channel for the various other contents of the NEAT PG and yes, see you next Saturday. Thank you. See ya. Bye.